Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the basics of the glymphatic system, not the lymphatic system that we talk about in other videos. This is the glymphatic system with a G, which is responsible for waste clearance from the brain. But before we do that, let's do a brief review of the flow of cerebrospinal fluid through the brain. And you can follow over here on this picture if you'd like. Now, we start off with the ventricles. The ventricles are spaces within the brain tissue, but they're not empty. They contain cerebrospinal fluid. The first of these ventricles are two of them, the lateral ventricles, which are technically the first and second ventricles. Now in this picture, the left half of the brain has been removed. So this semi-transparent, semi-opaque structure right here that you can see, this is the right lateral ventricle. The left one's been removed because the left hemisphere has been removed. And the way that the lateral ventricles get cerebrospinal fluid is through these specialized structures called choroid plexuses. Choroid plexuses are clusters of cells that basically filter the arterial blood and convert it into a new substance, which is cerebrospinal fluid. And its purpose is to have the exact consistency and chemicals and all that in order to properly nourish the brain tissue, i.e. the neurons of the brain. And all of these ventricles have a choroid plexus. Okay, so that's where the lateral ventricles get their cerebrospinal fluid. Now, the cerebrospinal fluid from the lateral ventricles travels through a space called the interventricular foramen. That's right here. And this allows passage of cerebrospinal fluid from both of the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. And here's the third ventricle right here, uh, right near the hypothalamus and the thalamus, basically the diencephalon. Third ventricle receives CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid, from the lateral ventricles, but it also itself has a choroid plexus that will continually make more CSF. From the third ventricle, the cerebrospinal fluid travels down this tube right here called the cerebral aqueduct, which takes the CSF to the fourth ventricle right here. The cerebral aqueduct actually splits the midbrain in half. So this structure right here is the midbrain. And so over here, you have the corpora quadrigemina, and anteriorly, you would have the cerebral peduncles. And so the cerebral aqueduct kind of splits that right in the middle. And then right here, just anterior to the cerebellum, but posterior to the pons, this would be the fourth ventricle. Again, this also has a choroid plexus, which gives it more cerebrospinal fluid. Now with the fourth ventricle, as you go inferiorly, it actually narrows into this structure called the central canal of the spinal cord. This is not a branch of the fourth ventricle, it's actually a continuation of it, it's just more narrow and goes down the length of the spinal cord. Now from the fourth ventricle, there's also three other small openings that allow cerebrospinal fluid to go to other parts of the brain. And those are the left and right lateral apertures, and then also the median aperture. And these just allow cerebrospinal fluid to go to different parts of the brainstem. From the brainstem, they can eventually go up to the cerebral areas. But once cerebral spinal fluid moves out of the central canal of the spinal cord, and once it moves three, any of these three apertures right here, it ends up in a space within the brain tissue called the subarachnoid space. Now in terms of meninges, the subarachnoid space is basically between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. That's the subarachnoid space. Now, this cerebrospinal fluid circulates in the subarachnoid space, but it can't just stay in the brain. It obviously has to be cleared from the brain because the CSF is taking up waste products. And so one of the ways that the brain gets rid of the cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space is it enters into structures called sinuses. The one up here at the top is called the superior sagittal sinus, and that we talk about in another video in more detail, so you can find the link to that video in the description. The other place that cerebrospinal fluid will go is the perivascular space. The perivascular space is a space that is superficial to structures of the vasculature, like arteries, veins, and capillaries. And we're going to talk about this as it relates to the glymphatic system on the next slide. So the pieces will be coming together. Either way, from the sinuses or the perivascular space, that cerebrospinal fluid will eventually move back into the veins, and that will eventually be taken back to the heart. And we'll talk about how that happens. 
So what is the perivascular space? To answer that question, take a look at this glial cell right here. This is an astrocyte, and astrocytes are characterized by having these extensions all over the main part of their bodies. Okay? And if you look at the terminal part of any of the extensions, it terminates with an astrocyte foot. So we're taking a big zoom in on that right here. So here's the terminal part of the astrocyte extension, basically its leg. And then its foot right here, also in green, actually wraps around small blood vessels, like small veins, small arteries, and capillaries. Here in red, or dark red, you see the wall of a capillary. It doesn't have to be a capillary. It could be a small artery or a small vein. And then inside, here's the lumen of that vessel, right? And in white here is this space that's created, because the foot, as it wraps around the vessel, it doesn't hug it super tight. It actually leaves this space in here, and this space is the perivascular space. Now, if this space is around a small artery, it's termed a periarterial space. So perivascular is more general, and periarterial and perivenous are more specific. But how does the perivascular space relate to the glymphatic system? Well, the perivascular space actually contains cerebrospinal fluid. So let's suppose up here, this is the subarachnoid space right here, and it contains cerebrospinal fluid. And you'll notice over here on the left, this is a small artery, and over here on the right, this is a small vein. And in this region of the picture, so the left two-thirds, we are in the central nervous system in the brain. So if you look over here on the left of the picture, you'll see a small artery, and on either side, really around the entire circumference, because we're looking at the longitudinal view, there's paraarterial space, and that's what you see here in this kind of dark blue. And then you'll see here an astrocyte, and it has all these extensions, or these legs. These legs are terminating at feet that are in contact with that small artery. And if we zoom in on one of those extensions, we can see the extension right here. Here's the foot that's going around this small artery, right? And in this dark blue, this is that paraarterial space, and it has this cerebrospinal fluid. And so what's happening is the cerebrospinal fluid actually circulates from the subarachnoid space, and then it moves into this paraarterial space, which is actually made possible by the presence of these astrocyte projections. The cool thing is, is from the paraarterial space right here, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid is actually able to move across this astrocyte foot wall right here and just generally into all this neural tissue right here. And so in this picture, the cerebrospinal fluid is moving from left to right. And so eventually that cerebrospinal fluid will move into the paravenous space right here. We have a similar setup on the small veins as we do for these small arteries. And so we have this paravenous space and that cerebrospinal fluid moves into that space and travels along the veins. Now, as this fluid moves inferiorly from the brain down into the neck, obviously in the neck, that's not where the brain is, so there's no astrocytes there, right? And so you don't actually have a paravenous space. What actually happens is this fluid actually moves between the smooth muscle and the basement membrane. Okay, there's a space there as well okay, that functions very similarly to the paravenous space. But in any case, from that paravenous space, that fluid eventually is going to be picked up by the lymphatic system here in green, and then that fluid will, of course, be returned to the heart. Now, why go to all this trouble to have this fluid be able to move from the paravascular space of the small artery through the neural tissue to the paravascular space of the small vein? Well, it's because neurons generate waste products. And yes, we can talk about carbon dioxide and potassium ions and hydrogen ions. That's true. This fluid does pick that up and move it to the venous system. However, there's two really important waste products that we don't want accumulating in this neural tissue. And those are tau protein and beta amyloid. So tau protein and beta amyloid are two abnormal proteins that form to some extent in all individuals. But as this fluid pulsates from the arterial side over here to the venous side, that fluid actually picks up these two waste products, brings them into the venous system, and then they're eliminated by some mechanism. And so this system of waste removal from the arterial side to the venous side within the brain, this is called the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system's purpose is waste removal.
And one of the ways that you get this fluid triggered to move from this side to this side is that the arterial side has pulses because it is still subject to the force from the heart contraction, right? Arteries, you feel a pulse. And so you get pulses and pulses and pulses, and that pulses the fluid from the arteries over to the veins. And you get the waste products picked up, they go to the venous side, and they're eventually eliminated. So what would happen if a person had issues or errors with the glymphatic system? Well, they're going to have compromised waste removal. And so wastes, including these two proteins, are going to slowly accumulate over time. Why is that bad? These two proteins right here, if they accumulate too much, they tend to accumulate exponentially, and they kill neurons. And that leads to Alzheimer's disease, a certain type of dementia. And so somebody with a diagnosis of end-stage Alzheimer's disease is going to have a lot more of these proteins. So the level of these proteins actually indicates um, how bad the Alzheimer's is. And at some point, once you get to a critical threshold of their accumulation, you start to deteriorate. And that's obviously not good. So hopefully that makes sense. There's one other application of this, and that's sleep. What does this have to do with sleep? Well, some researchers investigated this, and it turns out that the glymphatic system is actually more active during deep sleep. That means when you go to sleep at night, the glymphatic system is helping to get rid of these proteins from accumulating in the neural tissue, um, and by doing that, it's helping to prevent basically Alzheimer's disease. And so what does that mean if you're not getting adequate sleep? Well, if you're not getting adequate sleep, uh, these are probably accumulating more than in somebody who is getting adequate sleep. So does that mean that if you don't get any sleep tonight, you're going to end up with Alzheimer's? No, but chronically not getting enough sleep is going to increase your risk of getting Alzheimer's. And so if you already have a genetic predisposition to that, then not getting enough sleep is going to dramatically increase your chances of developing Alzheimer's disease. Because remember, just having the genetics for something doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's just a predisposition in many cases. And so bottom line, make sure you're getting enough sleep. And that is all there is to the glymphatic system. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.